Barry Deska from Singapore. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, I, I uh, thought I'd like to introduce a different dimension uh, to this discussion. And, and I would suggest that while uh, the, in, in Southeast Asia, the conflicts that uh, have been discussed are conflicts which are internal to the societies. However, the new problem that emerges uh, is one of a more pan-Islamic character, which, which, uh, which is a network dimension going beyond state-centered uh, uh, conflicts. The Jamaa Islamiyah uh, uh, movement, for example, uh, had its roots not just in any one country, but uh, with members from Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, the southern Philippines, and southern Thailand. And I would suggest that if we look, given the uh, uh, speed at which ISIS the, the Islamic State in Iraq and, and Greater Syria has grown, and uh, the influence it has had on Islamic radicalization and radical movements in the region, that this will be the next stage uh, which governments will have to deal with. The problem is that we are dealing with the issue on a state-centered basis, but the, uh, the movement that we are facing actually operates across borders in a very network-centric basis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. Dr. Yusuf Mashal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, same as it's the conflicts that we have heard, um, I am from the Kingdom of Bahrain, and we did have a conflict. It also happened during the what's called the Arab Spring. During that time in, 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 in uh, 2011, uh, a lot of uprisings are happening within West Asia and North uh, uh, Africa. Uh, over th there were countries that they have overthrown their re leaders, uh, as we've seen in Tunisia, in uh, Egypt, in uh, uh, Libya. It's still going on in Yemen. It's still going on in Syria. Uh, Bahrain is a, a small constitutional monarchy since 2002. And uh, it was threatened at that same time by uh, terrorist groups uh, backed up by Iran to uh, thinking that they can ride the same boat of what's happening with the Arab Spring. Uh, however, uh, the, the government of Bahrain was uh, awake uh, to such actions and stood hard for such uh, terrorists backed up by, uh, by Iran. Several steps were taken directly by His Majesty the King, uh, where he first asked for a national dialogue that puts the whole spectrum of the society sit together, more than 300 of uh, uh, non-government societies sat together on a table and came up with some reforms that became a, a change in the constitutions after, uh, after that. Then His Majesty has asked for an international commission of inquiry, led by uh, uh, the famous Mr. Sharif Basuni. And this was asked to determine whether the events of February and March 2011 uh, uh, involved any violation of human rights. He also established a local committee to study the report of this commission and to implement whatever outcomes that came out. Also, he created a, a strong international media composing of all the embassies and the international media to clear that Bahrain is not having an uprising, 
Bahrain is having a terrorism backed up by Iran. His Majesty has saved Bahrain in within less than seven months. It would have been a definite sectarian war in, in Bahrain that would have been the same as uh, uh, Syria and the same as Iraq and same as Libya right now. I must conclude that political uh, problems in Bahrain is, is not really over yet, but uh, it is in the way to be resolved uh, on the dialogue table and not through the machine guns. And the experience of His Majesty in Bahrain has really taught us that patience with leaderships uh, that believes in no losers and dignity is preserved to all uh, uh, save, can save the country. And this is what I have seen yesterday in the speech of uh, uh, the, the President of Colombia, which I feel that he is on the same steps and we wish the same thing will happen to Colombia very soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Marshall, for that uh, perspective on the internal security problems in your, in your own country and for pointing out the importance of, uh, of negotiations and uh, patience. Uh, Ambassador Watanabe. Many thanks. I am the ambassador of Japan here in Colombia. During, during these two years, I have been observing and following up on what is occurring in Havana. I would also like to thank the four speakers for sharing their experiences with us. In regards to the peace negotiations in Colombia, we hope an agreement will be reached sooner or later. And secondly, after this agreement, perhaps there will be an approval on part of the people of Colombia. And third, there will probably be support and help from the international community, including Japan. But afterwards, there will be a very difficult period in time, and this is forgiveness and reconciliation. Within a family, if a member of the family, a son or a daughter, if they were killed by a FARC member, will they be forgiven? It's very difficult. It's very difficult. And I believe that on this point, I would like to ask Dr. Costa, in the case of the people of El Salvador, how they in El Salvador were able to overcome this issue of forgiveness and reconciliation. I would like to hear from General Naranjo and Dr. Costa. Many thanks. And from the IISS, Antonio Sampaio. Gracias. Me um, gustaría. Thank you. I would like to remind you that there's still a small presence of the Sendero Luminoso on the south of Peru. So I believe there is an incredible longevity of these groups in Latin America. Latin America is a very peaceful region, but the FARC is the oldest insurgency in the southern hemisphere. So I believe there is a problem both in regards to political motivations for the insurgencies as well as a connection with informal economies, illegal economies that promote or support this resistance and these insurgencies. So I would like to ask, do you know, Costa, what do you think of the remains of the Sendero Luminoso? What do you think of this resistance that they still have, even though it might be small, and that the state is much stronger now than it was before? And to General Oscar Naranjo, what, how can we be at peace that the FARC groups will now 
be a part of this peace process. And now, General Hassanan. Thank you, Chair. My name is Lieutenant General Atta Hasnan. I'm from the Indian Army. And I speak with about 40 years of experience as a conflict manager, from the tactical to the strategic level, in all uh, insurgencies in India, and we've had many of them. But my remarks are not based upon any particular insurgencies, are uh, generic remarks. Uh, firstly, I would say Latin America, I think, is most fortunate today as being the only continent which is actually not affected in any way by the scourge of a radical Islamic terrorism. I think it's a great opportunity for Latin America that isolated as it is, it is from this networked scourge which is troubling the world today, this is the opportunity which Latin America must actually take. And its relative peace which is existing, it must take it forward to achieve everything on the social and the economic front. Having said that, I have two observations primarily. The first is related to conflict termination and conflict resolution. And the main thing which I want to speak about is what I call the concept of victory. I think Dr. Jalal really outstandingly summed it up. Every nation has got its own concept of victory when it comes to fighting a conflict, uh, an internal conflict. I would call uh, Indonesia's example in Aceh as a fantastic act of prudence and its definition of its own concept of victory. But more often than not, you'll find the nations have a problem with national ego. And national ego always leads to the problem of fighting the last mile of the conflict. When you fight the last mile in a kinetic way with the use of armies, you will always find that that conflict will continue to persist. And that's a great lesson which actually comes out of Indonesia. Having said that, I would also say that rebuilding societies, in the rebuilding of societies, the most important aspect we have to remember is that economics drives peace, but much more than economics, perhaps it is social engineering. And in social engineering, three or four issues which come to light straight away. One is, from my experience, the empowerment of women, the empowerment of youth, and my country is a country with 65% of the youth below 25 years of age today. The empowerment of youth through skill development and skill management, and then bringing in education, health services, and jobs. It is this ultimately which leads to conflict termination and conflict resolution. With this in mind, what, we, what can we do actually to cooperate? And such a dialogue, how can it be made more effective? I, I think what we really need to do is to get think tanks of different countries, strategic think tanks of different countries. I know outstanding think tanks exist in Indonesia. I know they exist in Philippines. And uh, we can have some great networking with these think tanks. And I think the mother organization of all this should be double I, double S. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have time for uh, two more very, very brief points. Um, Mr. Ulbari. Thank you very much. I have a brief comment to request that General Naranjo please refer more broadly to the issue of justice in the context of the negotiations. I recall from your most recent ascension speech from your second period, or in his speech, President Santos spoke of the efforts to end the conflict as a step towards holistic peace, and holistic peace as an instrument for the complete development of Colombia. He established a series of very important goals from the perspective of growth, education, social integration, etc. I believe that we could say that justice is something like the harpoon for the bridge that could drive from the end of the conflict to peace. But that arc has poses some important challenges. On the one hand, the equilibrium to strike the, between peace and justice. How can we know how much is necessary in order to achieve what President Santos referred to last night, a maximum of justice in the context of peace? The other is 
the balance between reconciliation and accountability. Any society that has been as affected by a conflict as the Colombian one, a society in which atrocities have been committed, part of the population will expect certain accountability. So what I would like is for you to refer a little more specifically to these balances that are so difficult. Thank you. There was someone at the back whose nameplate I couldn't quite quite read. He just raised his hand again. That will be the, the Muchas final. gracias. Yes, I can't, sorry, Muchas I can't gracias. Read. Thank you very much, moderator. My name is Miguel Duran. I am the president of the Colombian Korean Chamber of Commerce and Industry. I would like very briefly and succinctly to exalt the analytical clarity with which General Naranjo exposed the crux of the current peace process in my country. I would like to summarize the points from each of the presenters on how the successful progress of peace has been achieved within the framework of these policies. I am absolutely convinced that the Colombian government fulfills the requirements in order to consolidate peace. First of all, we enjoy leadership. President Santos, not only as Minister of Defense, but as head of state, has known how to expertly and intelligently guide the entire process, despite the fact that we have not had a natural disaster as the tsunami that the representative from Indonesia mentioned. But we have had a political tsunami that originated in, but was originated by a former head of state who experiences nostalgia for power. Secondly, we have pragmatism. The antecedents, as the general mentioned, we studied the precedent in 30 odd countries that experienced violence and tragedy of an ongoing war. With that criteria, President Santos looks to the future and has called on Colombians to feel the pain of six million victims, which are certainly calling for the, an end of the war. So this pragmatism has brought us to conceive of this policy of reconciliation in which every Colombian has his greatest hopes. It's a process that for the first time in the history of the world, generals and military men have taken the guerrilla on head on in order to de-escalate the war and consolidate peace. And I would also like to credit one of the delegates with regards to his comments on, on peace, forgiveness, and reconciliation. It's not easy, but I was, I bore witness to a Colombian woman whose parents and siblings were killed. She arrived in Havana. She faced the guerrilla, analyzed the circumstances. The guerrilla apologized for the unbearable acts committed, and she granted them her forgiveness. That is political will in the interest of peace. And to that end, and under President Santos' policies, we have our greatest hopes. Thank you. Important point. Um, we, we're running out of time, but I would like each of our four panelists to have the chance to, to respond. Um, if each of you could respond maybe in, uh, with a maximum of three minutes or so of, of, uh, of comments, and uh, I would like to ask you to respond in the reverse order. So, uh, Mr. Bachani first, and then uh, Dino Patti Jalal, and thirdly, Dr. Costa, and finally, General Naranjo. Mr. Bachani, please. Thank you. 
Did Zeros mention uh, about the uh, pan-Islamic radicalization? I think what's important here is uh, interstate cooperation. I know for a fact that uh, many countries are sharing intelligence information as far as uh, some of the possible terrorists are concerned. In our particular case, I know some countries have shared information with us uh, in terms of the possible presence of terrorists in southern Mindanao. I think that's very important. Uh, I'm not sure with, in terms of some formal mechanism on how to institutionalize, institutionalize that because definitely uh, there is a need for that. Uh, I think we have seen also there were some questions about uh, transitional justice and reconciliation. I think this is very important in terms of uh, especially post-agreement implementation in terms of the mechanisms uh, that will be institu instituted uh, to really provide uh, justice and reconciliation for the people who suffered. Uh, Yeah, I guess we also saw that the, as a common thread in all of these cases was the question of leadership. Uh, I think it was mentioned in the four cases uh, that we heard this afternoon how important leadership is uh, in really trying to arrive at uh, peaceful settlements and subsequent uh, implementation of these agreements. Uh, that's uh, all I can say for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Martina. Thank you. I would like to add a little bit on the, the subject of forgiveness uh, and, and reconciliation moving forward. Uh, I didn't talk about uh, East Timor today because we didn't have time, uh, but one of the things that uh, we did uh, uh, during our time to heal the wounds uh, from our, uh, the, the trouble that we had with uh, Timor-Leste, with East Timor, was uh, a visit by President Yudo Yono, uh, emotional visit of both to the cemetery of Indonesian soldiers killed in Timor-Leste, in the capital of East Timor. And after that, after he paid tribute to the military cemetery, he went directly to the cemetery where Indonesian military officers uh, shot at demonstrators, the Santa Cruz uh, Cemetery. Uh, that one move where he went to both cemeteries and paid respect to both uh, was of enormous symbolic uh, significance and sent huge political message to the Timorese that we are now in a new era. No previous president would dare, uh, would take a political risk to visit the cemetery in Santa Cruz where Indonesian military had shot demonstrators. But uh, President Yudo you know, took that, that risk and, and afterwards there was an agreement made with Sanana Guzmao, the, the president of Timor-Leste, that the government of uh, Timor-Leste would rehabilitate the uh, cemetery of Indonesian military. Uh, so, uh, soldiers uh, in, in uh, Delhi. So both sides got into the, the act of really reaching out uh, and, and uh, trying to forgive and promote reconciliation uh, led from the top, uh, but felt uh, by, by, by the grassroots. And, and that psychological impact uh, really has helped uh, to promote uh, stable relations between Indonesia and Timor-Leste now. I, th I think if you look at any areas around the world, there are hardly a case where two sworn enemies, such as Indonesia and Timor-Leste, with such a painful and bloody history, has become two neighbors in Southeast Asia region with the best relations. It's, it's quite a remarkable uh, transformation of relationship. I think that's absolutely right, and uh, I, I second that, that y your country and, and Timor have some of the, the best bilateral relations among Southeast Asian countries, which is absolutely remarkable. Dr. Gino Costa. De acuerdo con... I would agree with my friend Sampaio in that I had mentioned the defeat of the subversive Peruvian organizations in the early 90s. One of them, Sendero Luminoso, there were two groups that survived and that retreated into inaccessible areas of the Colombian territory, coca valleys in effect, and there they were able to maintain 
and prolong their survival. In territories that were very focused, difficult to access, therefore, it was very difficult to eradicate them militarily speaking. In 2011, in one of those valleys, saw the defeat of one of those groups, a definitive defeat after many years of progressive weakening. The Sendero Luminoso persists in another valley, although very run down. So we believe that even in Peru, we are coming to the end of this seventh, second cycle because the strategic defeat took place more than 20 years ago. But these two last vestiges still existed, and it's highly likely that in the next years, this process of elimination will continue to consolidate itself. There is a relationship to illegal economies because these groups exist in coca valleys, but they are not the armed expression of the drug trafficking because not all the coca valleys, not all the coca valleys have military operations. So more likely it is a political objective that uses illegal trade such as the drug trade. I would also like to agree with our friend from India mentioned as well by another one of the members who intervened in the sense that we are very lucky in Latin America to not have to face the threat of Islam fundamentalism. This is not present in our region, which is very fortunate, certainly. But in addition, to answer to Ambassador Watanabe, another point is that we speak the same language, we share a culture and a religion. So these conflicts are more political and ideological than anything else without the presence of religious differences or ethnic differences or even linguistic ones. So resolving these conflicts, despite how difficult it is, is perhaps easier than in situations where there are also religious and linguistic differences. That's another advantage that we enjoy. And to answer Ambassador Watanabe's question, I believe that the negotiating process itself is where the reconciliation germinates. It is later much easier to take it to the rest of society if leaders are committed to that process of reconciliation, which is what I believe took place in Salvador. Certainly, immediately after the signing of peace, it's important to maintain vigilance in order to avoid phenomenons of violence which could turn the process back, which is why I said in Salvador, international presence was very helpful to ensure peace building. I'd like to wrap up by saying that I think that happily in Latin America, we are a region without interstate conflicts, almost without. The few that exist are being sorted out by the international court in The Hague. The few conflicts with regards to mostly maritime borders and the few armed conflicts are being wrapped up as well. So the great challenges in terms of security have more to do with what could be called ordinary or petty crime, which continue to be important challenges and they affect the quality of life of those of us who live in this region but they are less delicate and less difficult to address than the armed internal conflicts and the interstate conflicts. Thank you. Optimistic point. And finally, General Naranjo. Given that I have the privilege of closing this panel, and as I said in my initial presentation, I am forced to stand in order to answer you. The truth is that after listening to these illustrious panelists, and particularly after listening to the questions and reflections of our guests, I would like to mention three or four points that we consider crucial. There's the general issue of leadership. I believe that the Colombian process, the negotiation 
of conflicts throughout the world and here in Colombia imply that political leadership is stronger than discourse based on fear as a political mobilizer. There can be no doubt that after decades of violence in our country, but also throughout the world, fear has been the foundation for putting together political arguments and creating consensus. I feel that the new leadership, the leadership that generates trust in the ability to resolve these conflicts, should be a leadership that puts together its discourse from the need to generate trust, which is another factor that was mentioned on this stage as critical to success. And with that faith and that trust in the present, we can transform the future, generating hope in that future. If we take a look at what happens in Colombia, we could say that leadership is fractured between those who are hawking fear and those who believe that we have come to a time where it's necessary to build trust and create hope for the future. Two, I would say that the negotiation of this conflict in Colombia, the government is realistic and sees it under the context of what is taking place globally and regionally. And here I would make an observation especially for our guests from the Trans-Pacific Alliance who observe us from across the Pacific. From the close to half a million homicides that the world produces in a year, 136,000 homicides take place in Latin America, which is to say that Latin America is today the most violent region of the world and contributes with 36% of the homicides in the entire planet, which is why a country like ours that is seeking to give an end to a conflict is also bearing a sign, hope for the world, that we want to reduce violence in Latin America. And therefore, that realism, as Gino said, can take us to consider that the need to work for the post-conflict from now in order to not allow that crime reestablish itself, that is the objective of the government and the objective it has taken to the negotiation table. And the national government, through what the president has determined will be a ministry for post-conflict. Fourth, I would say that in the case of Colombia, in order to give our compatriots certainty, but also to the international community, is that the, DD, the affairs of the DDR, these issues are central to the agreement. Peace in this process, under the concept, under the government's concept, is that peace means more security, not moving back in terms of security. And to this end, we have taken careful note of the lessons closest to us, most of them in Central America. When you speak to a Central American citizen, they may say that there was less violence during the war than now with the signed peace agreement. So what we are seeking now as we end this conflict is that in order to take peace to deep Colombia, we need to generate citizenship so that citizens can exercise their freedoms and their rights. And we also need to take the market to these remote reaches of Colombia so that the guerrilla will fall apart as an economic necessity. And this ties in to the question with regards to justice, which I enormously appreciate. Peace can only be guaranteed if a society understands that justice is necessary. But here, we're talking about a need that the contemporary globalized world has imposed upon us for the resolution of conflict. We say this once and again, we are the first country in the world to negotiate the solution to a conflict politically under the Rome statutes. And that means that they will not be general amnesties and therefore there will not be a cosmetic peace masked by amnesties. Having said that, we are aware that humanity and its legal developments have given life and light to a right 
that is part of transitional justice. What I am referring to is that we're not applying regular justice. We are facing the enormous challenge of assimilating the challenges of transitional justice, which is about resolving conflicts in our particular case. What does this mean? In a very real manner, it means changing paradigms and beginning to notice that justice, when we are resolving a conflict, is not limited exclusively to the law, criminal law, or the imposition of sanctions, punitive sanctions. Here, we need a combination, as provided for by the pillars of transitional justice, between truth, rights to non-repetition, reparations, and justice. These are the balances that we must seek out so that Colombians in consensus can solve these wounds and heal them. And here I would like to repeat what was said earlier here is how much justice versus how much forgiveness, how much justice versus how much peace. Those are the questions. And here I would say I would rescue the old aphorism by Tony Blair with his third way idea where he pointed out that in terms of economics, what should be imposed is as much state as is necessary and as much market as possible. So here I would say as much justice as is necessary and as much truth as possible as foundations for the reparations, the right to non-repetition and the possibilities of reconciliation. Finally, this has been mentioned by earlier panelists in the Colombian case, despite five decades of violence, what we are finding is a, an enormously constructive and brave message built through a narrative that is truly moving, which is the narrative of the victims. Victims are the ones that, with greatest vehemence, are willing to forgive and reconcile. So therefore, the question is, what's happening with the rest of Colombians? And I would say that we cannot lose sight of the fact that in Colombia, not like in other conflicts, we are a nation where conflict, post-conflict, and normality are coexisting. We're not talking about a single nation involved in the conflict, because all the, the, the entire nation will not move into post-conflict at the same time. These different realities are all mixed in time. Our conflict has been taking place in rural Colombia, a Colombia that we could call Deep Colombia, where our state has only very precariously entered with military or with police, but has been unable to take more justice, more citizenship, and more market. Therefore, for the urban Colombian, the modern Colombian, a Colombian in a city as wonderful as Cartagena, or in Bogota, or Medellin, the conflict seems remote. And finally, we can say that a good amount of our compatriots of that more normal, more urban country see the conflict as something so distant that they are almost in a comfort zone where resolving the conflict isn't even so important to them. The great, the great political challenge is for all of us in Colombia be able to show that peace in Colombia will bring fruits for all Colombians. And that peace is not just a matter of putting end to the guns, but that peace is for democracy and democratic values to go deeper so that ultimately we can respond to citizen outrage. The outrage that we saw in the Arab Spring, but that is also very near to us. Outrage that demands that the state be more effective, more competent, and near to citizens so that political leadership generates trust, commitment for each citizen. The peace for Colombians is the opportunity for a second democratic wave, which since the birth of our republic, it's a new opportunity to renew markets and take a higher quality of life to our citizens. And it's an opportunity to pay our debts with the thousands, millions of victims that this conflict has generated. Thank you.
General, thank you for those uh, stirring and at the same time very, very wise comments which I think bring this session to an end in the best possible way. I would like to thank you for you and uh, the other three panelists for your excellent presentations and for your, your responses to the points raised um, by our delegates and to our delegates for, for the good questions that you, you raised and for your participation. Um, before, we, before we end this session, I have just two, um, two points to bring to your attention. First, the dinner this evening, the gala dinner, will be in the Hilton, Gar Hilton Gardens, uh, uh, and the dinner will commence at 8 p.m. in about one hour and 40 minutes' time. And secondly, regarding tomorrow's sessions, the special sessions will uh, will commence at 0900 hours, 9 a.m. So please make sure that you're here, uh, here in the, the appropriate room that you've been allocated to for your special session a little bit early. Thank you very much, and please enjoy the evening. Thank you.